invocation and Council Member White for our pledge. And I would like to thank our hosts at the Croc Center for making this beautiful space available to us. I'd like to acknowledge uh, members of the City uh, Common Council who are here with us, along with the Council Attorney and our City Clerk, John Bordy. And I want to thank all who are in attendance and who are following this by live stream uh, or on television for the opportunity to provide a progress report and a statement of vision as this administration works to deliver a fresh start in South Bend. We are just over 100 days into the life of this administration and already there is a great deal of news to report, but this is only the very beginning of our work. As mayor, my most important job is to define and communicate a vision for how our city can be safe, prosperous, well-educated, well-connected, and well-served by government. Those five themes, safety, prosperity, education, connectedness, and efficient service guided my campaign and they guide this administration. Tonight, the state of our city is hopeful. No one can ignore the challenges before us as we move into the future, but no one can deny that this community is rallying as never before to seize the opportunities at hand. South Bend has very good timing right now. We are in a unique window of opportunity to come together and to do business in a new way. It is already starting to happen, and all of us are responsible for keeping up that momentum. One of the surest signs of South Bend's momentum is the place where we gather here this evening. Right here, where downtown meets the west side, we see what public-private partnership can physically look like. This facility represents a $64 million investment in our community, built in partnership with the Salvation Army, the city, the state, and countless private partners. Opened in January, the Croc Center is already serving thousands in our community, and it has a generous scholarship program covering up to 75% of the cost of membership in order to ensure that low income is no obstacle for any family that wants to take advantage of the fitness, arts, faith, and education programming here. Even the way this facility was built is an example for partnerships going forward, empowering women and minority-owned businesses through concrete and achievable goals as part of the contracting process that built this amazing structure. Tonight, we are close to a number of other bright spots in the coming rebirth of the downtown area. I pulled up a map here to remind us all that we're just a six-minute walk from the new and improved Kovaleski Stadium. From there, it's about two minutes walk north to the doorstep of a new Veterans Affairs Clinic, which will have its grand opening in a few weeks. And if you headed in the other direction, a three or four minute walk south would bring you to the looming tower of an empty Studebaker building that may soon see new life as one of the most technologically advanced and imaginative mixed use facilities in the country. I'll have more to say in a moment about these developments that set the tone for South Bend's motion. But before I get there, let's pause to give credit where credit is due. Many of the things I will describe were set in motion long before I took office. The credit for our progress begin belongs to many people, including community organizations, the private sector, and prior administrations, as well as ours. I know we have at least two former mayors of South Bend in attendance, I think I spotted. Uh, Mayor and Governor Kernan and Mayor Lickey. Um, and uh, I do not presume to claim credit for everything that is happening or that everything we'll discuss tonight. It also represents the efforts of thousand, uh, over a thousand city employees, very few of whom ever get the spotlight. And I would like for every city employee who is here uh, to be recognized for the hard work that they do. Please stand for a moment and be recognized. Also, what I'm about to share represents just a small sample of the activities underway throughout local government. Um, but let's begin. The first order of business in building the new administration was to organize an office staff for the 14th floor. In these frugal times, the mayor's office accounts for less than one half of 1% of overall city spending. Yet the team we've assembled does an incredible amount of work, from resolving thousands of citizen concerns to organizing our relationship to the press. 
We redefined roles and reconfigured the staff into a chief of staff model for maximum efficiency. And this group of people works long hours, day in, day out, to serve the community and solve problems. Everyone agreed in last year's election that getting more jobs in our community would be critical. And already there is great momentum as we work to prepare for our economic comeback. Let's start by looking a little more closely at that progress downtown. In January, I approved an investment to create a veterans affairs clinic in the heart of our city at the old Gates Toyota building. Building at light speed, this clinic will be treating patients less than a month from now. It adds up to 100 jobs to the downtown area and will bring at least 50,000 patients a year and their families to a part of town that has been too quiet for too long. Best of all, we had a chance to do it in a way that will actually save taxpayer money compared to the original plan for the site. Meanwhile, yesterday, the Redevelopment Commission approved investments in state-of-the-art power infrastructure and building renovation that will continue to build on the fiber optic nodes around Union Station. This not only paves the way for high-tech jobs, it gives us a chance to rehabilitate the largest remaining Studebaker structure, an underused assembly building of nearly a million square feet, and turn it into the hub of a renaissance district full of mixed uses for people to live, work, and play. On Monday, the Silver Hawks started the new season at Kovaleski Stadium in a terrific opening night that drew more than 4,000 people, the best opening night attendance anybody can remember. The new owner, Andrew Berlin, has invested millions of dollars of his own money in the stadium and in the team. And now we have a new destination downtown where families can enjoy the summer. These developments, along with this Croc Center, have all taken place in the second and sixth city council districts, areas that have felt left out of economic progress in our city for too long. We have much work to do in ensuring that economic growth reaches all sectors of the city. But what a great start we have in these downtown developments. Meanwhile, along the river, a successful growth in townhouses is proving that people once again want to live in the heart of our city. And it shows that downtown South Bend is learning once again how to treat our waterway as an asset, to turn and face our beautiful river. And later this year, South Bend will have a downtown high school open again for the first time since 1968. This facility will draw families from around the area into the heart of our city. And I hope that the private sector is ready to give people a place to visit and spend time in the area around St. Joe. These are just a few of the developments made possible by the city's community and economic development department. Under the management of division heads, Don Inks and Pam Meyer, employees continue the day-to-day -day work of strengthening our neighborhoods and our economy, even while we undertake a full strategic review of the department. Last year, 109 homes received repairs, 52 demolitions made way for new housing through federal programs managed by the city. Loans and tax abatements brought $33 million in new investment. Meanwhile, we're finding new ways to cut red tape so that employers have an easier time working with us. As a first step, we're cutting unnecessary duplication in the reporting requirements for tax abatements, a small but important move that will help businesses spend less time on paperwork and more time creating value and jobs in our community. Serious community and economic development means we also need to get serious about poverty. There have never been easy solutions, but we can and will do more. I was glad for the opportunity to work with advocates for transit-dependent families when Transpo faced difficult cuts. And while Transpo was not able to avoid cuts entirely or find a solution that could please everybody, I believe we made a lot of people better off by intervening to slow down the process and mitigate the effect on people who would be impacted the most. Our office also had constructive sessions with community leaders and banks to help vulnerable people get a leg up in this economy with better access to banking services and less dependence on predatory lenders. It's all part of a commitment to evaluate everything we do with a view toward how it impacts poverty in our community. There is, of course, much more to being a prosperous community than economic policy. Without safe streets and homes, there is no economic development, no quality of life. The last 20 years have brought a fundamental paradigm shift in the way that public safety is managed, and South Bend is gearing up to keep up with the times. Chief Stephen Cox in the fire department 
has been hard at work since the retirement in February of Chief Howard Buchanan after 38 years of dedicated and distinguished service. The department is adapting its strategic approach while continuing to address its day-to-day life-saving work. Last year, the department handled over 200 fires and over 14,000 life-saving EMS calls. The department not only puts out fires, but prevents them, carrying out nearly 3,000 inspections last year and reaching out to thousands of citizens with fire safety training. And earlier this year, a team of firefighters, led by Assistant Chief Jim Lopez, went to southern Indiana to help communities cope with the impact of devastating tornadoes, taking charge of a regional recovery team and returning to our community with valuable experience in disaster management and procedures. There has also, of course, been change in the police department. I'll have more to say about that later on this evening, but let me begin by reporting that interim police chief Chuck Hurley has thrown himself into his new job, drawing on a lifetime of military, police, and private security work, and he will serve our community well until a permanent chief is named. Former Chief Boykins is providing his support to ensure a smooth transition. Going forward, he will oversee the School Resources Officer Program and Street Crimes Unit and continue the important community policing work that has earned him respect over the years. Our police department handled more than 67,000 calls last year and made over 3,000 arrests. Their work is critical to the progress of this community. And going forward, we must preserve the gains in trust between the community and the police that have been achieved in recent years, achievements whose importance is not diminished by the change in leadership. I will listen closely to input from the community as we identify permanent leadership, and I know we will come out of this process with a stronger, community-oriented, and more effectively managed police force than ever. Safety and economic vitality in our neighborhoods depends on the enforcement of all the rules we agree to, not just criminal codes, but municipal codes. Led by Catherine Topple, our code enforcement department carries out difficult and often thankless work. Focusing on the safety and suitability of our properties, this department had more than 1,000 hearings and over 20,000 inspections last year. In May, we'll be opening a new animal control shelter, which will help reduce the euthanasia of healthy and adoptable pets. Council Member Valerie Shea continues to provide leadership in this area, and I have committed to her that we will work together in a mayor's alliance to address euthanasia rates and animal care, improve animal care in our community. Lastly, I want to point out that a partnership between solid waste and code enforcement departments to manage an illegal dumping crew has resulted in the removal of over two million pounds of trash. And I want to thank the members of the City Council for providing renewed funds for this important priority. Speaking of codes, often I'm asked whether we can look at integrating functions between county and city government. One area where we already do this is our consolidated county city building department, led by Chuck Bulow. This group works daily to ensure safety in our buildings and is now initiating the use of a new, fairer, and more efficient fee system to handle licensing and related needs when it comes to building. Economic growth also depends on quality of life. When parks and recreation officials from around the state chose South Bend for a conference this year, I addressed them and reminded them that by enhancing community life, they too are economic development professionals. Last year, our parks department brought hundreds of thousands of visitors to our zoo, to our public golf courses, to our stadium, to our recreation centers, and to special events like the Blues and Ribs Fest and the Daddy-Daughter Dance. The Parks Department was recognized as Agency of the Year by the Indiana Parks and Recreation Association, and Director Phil St. Clair has an ambitious plan to raise attendance by another 5% for 2012. Meanwhile, the Moore Civic Auditorium was again recognized as a top 100 venue in the world by Polestar Magazine, selling 95,000 tickets last year for 74 performances. Director Dennis Andres has continued to proactively develop and market the Morris, even while also ensuring that the spectacular Palais Royale continues to draw business to the heart of our city. And while the Morris enhances our quality of life with performances on stage, our public works department makes us all better off from behind the scenes. Gary Gillott, widely regarded as one of America's best public works professionals, 
continues to advise the city as a volunteer after retiring at the end of last year, while a new city engineer, Mike Meacham, joins with years of experience in public works and engineering. When the city got an unexpected break in snowfall, workers did not sit on their hands. They took advantage of the chance to do extra projects like supplemental street cleaning and an early start to the leaf and yard waste pickup program. Last year, the department swept over 11,000 lane miles of streets and cleaned over half a million linear feet of sewers. Our solid waste team collected 27,800 tons of waste and in partnership with the Adopt-A-Block program, cleared over 100 blocks of major debris. The more I engage in government, the more I admire our quiet public servants in the waterworks and wastewater department. No one has ever called our office to congratulate us on the fact that their toilets are flushing properly <laughs> or to celebrate the fact that their faucets are putting out clean, safe drinking water. But there is something miraculous about the fact that last year we provided and processed about 5.7 billion gallons of it. One of the most innovative corners of city government is our excellent energy office, which exists in order to make our city government more sustainable and more responsible with taxpayer dollars by better managing our use of energy. Retrofitting the Parks Maintenance Building, the King Center, the Charles Black Gymnasium, and Fire Station 6, this office is already saving taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars, and they are just getting warmed up. Just before I took office, South Bend signed a consent decree with the federal government, ordering the largest public works project in the history of our city. We are one of many Midwestern communities required to change our sewer system to prevent untreated sewage from going into waterways during heavy rainfalls. It is important for citizens to understand that this change to our combined sewer overflow system will be expensive. Over 20 years, we were required to make an estimated $500 million in improvements so that we can cut our discharges by 95% and comply with the Clean Water Act. This is going to require excellent engineering and financing methods to try to cushion the impact this bill will have on budgets, bonds, and water bills. But while there have been new costs added to the city's burden, we also have identified some new savings. And under the leadership of Controller Mark Neal, our city's administration and finance department keeps our budget balanced and well organized. While some American cities are mired in excessive debt, South Bend has maintained a very good bond rating from S&P as well as Moody's and Fitch. And we are taking advantage of those lower interest rates to refinance the debt we do have, much as you would refinance a mortgage. This has already saved taxpayers more than $2.95 million, and we will continue to look for more savings. Our IT department installed a new phone system that will save taxpayers millions using voice over IP technology. The controller and human resources offices are carrying the ball forward from the previous, previous administration with a wellness program that allows city employees to share in the health care cost savings that they can create paying a reduced insurance premium in exchange for participation in wellness activities. And the Human Rights Commission, also overseen by the controller, addressed over 100 discrimination complaints last year. And they're now gearing up to incorporate the addition of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation to their scope. With this bill, our city joined over 160 American cities that say that no hardworking, high-performing employee should work or live in fear of losing their job just because of sexual orientation. The commission will enforce this law as they do all laws with fairness and integrity. Speaking of fairness and integrity, our city legal department, under the leadership of interim city attorney Aladine DeRose Smithburn, continues to staff and advise the administration and various boards. And while they often work behind the scenes, every citizen ought to be grateful for the hard work that these professionals put in day in, day out, despite having a smaller staff complement than usual this year. In February, I announced the formation of a mayor's task force on vacant and abandoned properties to identify problems and break down barriers when it comes to finding solutions. Co-chaired by national expert Professor Jim Kelly of the Notre Dame Law School, this task force is composed mainly of the city and county officials best positioned to deal with the problem along with other key community stakeholders. This group will report out later this summer, and it is already clear that cooperation between the city and the county is going to be absolutely vital 
for us to get to the answers. We're also going to rely on community participation, and the task force is coming soon to a neighborhood near you in order to listen to problems and solutions envisioned by neighbors when it comes to abandoned properties. These are just a few of the activities that our hardworking city employees have been undertaking to make this the best possible place to live, work, and play. But as I said earlier, we're only 102 days into the life of this administration, and much of the work is still to come. So I'd like to share a little bit more on the vision of where we're headed, what could come, and what it will take to get there. I mentioned some specific economic development projects in our city, but something much bigger is at stake. Now is our chance to redesign the way our whole community handles economic development. With the sunset of Project Future and the assumption of its duties by the St. Joseph County Chamber of Commerce, a new and potentially better organization of economic development is taking shape in our community. The Chamber of Commerce will increasingly take the lead on managing site selection and attraction opportunities and will continue in partnership with the city to work with existing businesses. Attracting new business is an important goal, but we can never forget to ensure that the employers who are already here are able to stay, to thrive, to grow, and to create more jobs. And that is at the heart of our partnership with the Chamber. Last year, a joint city-chamber initiative on business growth, funded by the city and staffed by the tireless Phil D'Amico, conducted 461 business visits in South Bend and resolved 115 different business issues to help employers stay and create more jobs in our city. That's the kind of public-private partnership we can build on. Meanwhile, a new organization, the Corporate Partnership for Economic Growth, pulls together players from around a six-county region to coordinate opportunities to make our whole area more competitive. Inside city government, we have been reimagining the future of our own community and economic development department. On day one, I promise to personally assume responsibility for decisions in this department while we undertake a full strategic and structural review. My office has led a top-to-bottom process to assess how we do business in this very important department, and we've emerged with a vision to move community and economic development forward. We're going to provide the department with a newer, less bureaucratic structure that enables people's skills to be matched to where they can have the most impact. We're going to use more of the tools available to us, not only tax incentives and real estate, but targeted investments and workforce development so that ours is truly a globally competitive economic region. And whenever we do spend economic development dollars in the future, it's going to be guided by a concrete set of guidelines and a clear strategy. This includes laying out expectations on measurable targets, such as the ratio of public to private dollars, expectations for jobs, and accountability and taxpayer protections to ensure both sides live up to their commitments. In late June, I will convene an economic summit to communicate these changes, to get key players under the same roof, and to ensure that everyone understands the role they can play in our community's new economic direction. The strategic goal of all this groundwork is to ensure that anyone who is prepared to create jobs in our community, whether a startup, an existing business, or an outside investor, knows exactly who to call we will make it easier to get action and easier to get answers. An unmistakable theme through all our economic development work is the deep importance of both K-12 and post-secondary education, which brings me to the second pillar of this administration's vision. Education is critical, and just because the city government isn't in charge of it doesn't diminish our obligation to help. I am meeting regularly with school superintendent Dr. Carol Schmidt and speaking with members of the school board as we continue to work to ensure the city and the school are partnering for the education of our kids. I've had opportunities to get into various classrooms in our primary, secondary, uh, and elementary buildings, and I'm always moved by the insightful questions of students and their interest in civic issues. Examples of how we can work together range from joint purchasing opportunities so that more school dollars actually make it into the classroom, to job training partnerships that help find high school graduates a place in our economy. Part of my job is also to celebrate success in the school system. And whether it's Adams High sending its championship mock trial team to nationals once again, or Riley representing our community at the statewide science Olympiad, 
We have much to be proud of in our public schools. We must also do more with post-secondary education in order to keep our local economy competitive and prepared for the jobs of the future. Local community colleges and vocational educational centers must be in dialogue with our employers so that we can have more of what is called demand-driven education. And I will convene dis discussions later this year on how to do just that. Meanwhile, we have a golden moment to ensure that our five universities and colleges are all strong partners for the city. I've met with leaders at Holy Cross, IU South Bend, and Notre Dame, and will soon engage St. Mary's and Bethel College on new ways to work together. IU South Bend continues to grow with over 8,000 students at a thriving urban campus. IUSB is charging forward with newly renovated student center, a major expansion of the education and arts building, and it's reaching beyond campus with initiatives like the Civil Rights Heritage Center led by faculty member Dr. Kevin James. Meanwhile, I feel confident in saying that the relationship between the city of South Bend and the University of Notre Dame is at an all-time high. We recently celebrated the anniversary of the Robinson Community Learning Center, which joins university and community together in projects that range from a Shakespeare program benefiting inner city youth to a computer club where I met one 90-year-old participant who told me she loves being in the digital age. The area around Notre Dame is poised for growth and its progress continues to rest on a deep neighborhood partnership. Now, much depends on us in the city as we seek to ensure that that zone, that area, where city meets university develops not as a buffer, but as a bridge between the two. At a brisk walk, you can get from the door of the Century Center to the Five Guys Burger Place by the campus in Notre Dame in less than half an hour on foot. From the same spot, you could bike to IUSB in less than 15 minutes. It's time to shorten our psychological distance between the city center and our campuses, and that goal will inform our planning from now on. I spoke of economic development and education, and neither of these can be separated from the most fundamental duty of any government, safety. The central theme of this administration's approach to safety will be accountability. By better using data and information to set targets and hold ourselves accountable, we can make better decisions and get better outcomes. With public safety now accounting for 80% of the general budget, we have to do more with the resources that we're already spending. Downtown will see a more visible police presence, including a police substation at a downtown storefront and bike patrols in the central business district. Meanwhile, in our neighborhoods, the Walk with a Cop program will encourage officers to spend more time out of their cars getting to know the residents that they are there to protect. While incidents of nonviolent crime like burglary and theft are down compared to last year, I am deeply concerned about the number of violent incidents we have seen this year, particularly since many of them involve our youth. It is clear to me that we must adopt a comprehensive community-wide youth violence prevention strategy based on the following three principles. First, we should learn from what other communities are doing. There are multiple models from around the country that we can draw on, and we don't have to invent the wheel. Secondly, whatever we do must be true to our own community and must be designed with a maximum of community buy-in. Policymakers, educators, religious leaders, law enforcement, parents, youth, all must have a voice in the formation of this strategy. Third, whatever we do must be based on proven methods and held accountable to measurable targets. This is vital because recent research has shown that some well-intentioned youth programs, such as the Scared Straight program, that sent young people in to visit pris prisons actually increase crime. In this, as with every other area of government, I will continue to make the case for us to use facts and evidence when we make decisions. It's not enough to show lots of activity. We have to demonstrate that the activity is leading to results. The fourth of the five pillars of our campaign and our administration is connectedness. Our city can become stronger by building up two kinds of connectedness, internal and external. By internal connectedness, I mean connections within our community. So many people in this community are ready to volunteer and partner to make it stronger. City government cannot and should not organize all volunteer activity, but we do have to help. 
and in time, we will build a city-supported clearinghouse to help link willing volunteers with worthy causes. Meanwhile, as a preview, let me show you just one small example of something we can do with partnership from the community. Perhaps you have had the experience of walking into the county city building and approaching the elevators. I think we can all agree that that lobby could be a little bit more welcoming. This is what that desk could look like. There is no taxpayer funding available to make it look like this. But we can clean up and staff a welcome desk like this with a modest amount of sponsorship and a reasonable amount of volunteer time. And our office is working with partners in the city to deliver just that later this year. I also want to stress the importance of mentorship. I'll have more to say about it later this year, but for now, let me just point out that one of the biggest ways anyone who cares about this city can make a difference for our community is to mentor a child through programs like the Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or the South Bend Community School Corporation's Dream Team. As time goes on, I will continue to champion other important ways for citizens to help move our city forward. We can all make a difference, and volunteers are going to be crucial to our city's success. Then there's external connectedness, thinking of ourselves in a broader context. I've been working with partners from around our area to make sure South Bend is better tied into the region and to the world. We have strong relationships with county officials, with Mishawaka Mayor Dave Wood, and other nearby communities. This matters because the simple reality is our community, or any community our size, cannot compete alone. We're part of a global economy now. Let me share the names of a few Chinese cities. Changchun, Zibo, Taiyuan, Shijiazhuang, and Ningbo. These cities have three things in common. First of all, I had never heard of them before sitting down to research this speech. <laughs> Secondly, each one of them has more than three million people. And third, not one of them is even in the top 20 in population among Chinese cities. Like it or not, we are now in the same economy as a minor city like the Chinese city of Xi Zhang and its 10 million people. My point is that to compete in this global economy, a community like South Bend or Mishawaka or Granger or Osceola doesn't have a chance unless it can join forces with those around it. That is the point of regionalism. And regionalism is the key to building our reputation across the broader Midwest, across the country, and around the world. Michiana has a good story to tell by stressing what is most distinctive in our economy, those things we do better than anyone else in the world, from certain kinds of nanotechnology research, to centers of excellence in fabricated metal products, to the enjoyment of college football. The fifth and final focus of the vision for our city, a theme I discussed over and over in the campaign, is that we have to have highly efficient, transparent, cost-effective government services in order to stay competitive and secure a good quality of life for everybody in South Bend. Setting the tone for this is why the very first thing I did in office was to introduce an ethics code for city employees. Some employees found this code a little strict but we have all learned to work within these important guidelines to avoid even the appearance of conflicts of interest. We also need to increase transparency and accessibility. That's one reason we established a monthly meeting where every city department head, as well as the mayor, is available. We call it Mayor's Night In or Mayor's Night Out. And every citizen can see department heads and or the mayor face to face with any issue on their minds. And we work together to find a solution. I'm also using press opportunities, from regular appearances on local television and before editorial boards, to the monthly Ask Pete column in the Tribune, to proactively connect with citizens on important matters. Transparency and accessibility is one of many issues where the Common Council has a crucial role to play. Council members are the officials closest to the concerns of citizens, and the city depends on a strong, balanced, and wise counsel. In order to ensure good communication, I've invested a great deal of time in meeting council members, not just in formal settings, but often one or two at a time. 
we had our first shared session on the budget process and look forward to many more. Both new and returning council members have already made major contributions to this city just in the last 102 days. And my door is always open to council members with any questions, any concerns, and any ideas. Later this year, we will also roll out a 311 line for information and city services. The end goal is a one-stop shop where citizens can get answers in real time. Not only can this make customer service more efficient, it can also provide us with data that we can use to make better management decisions. Emulating the city stat program used effectively in cities across the country, we will use real-time data as the basis for performance reviews, the same as any large business, to create more accountability and transparency and run the city more smoothly. By the time that effort is complete, we'll have capabilities we never had before. Detailed data on what issues the citizens call most often about, how long it takes us to address them, and how good of a job we do. Without that data, we cannot be a truly great customer service organization. With it, we can and will make better management decisions and provide outstanding services to all our citizens and organizations. We're also revamping the city's website. And later this year, we will deliver a new and improved look with a more user-friendly functionality and easy to find information. The overall vision is for technology to make it easier for citizens to solve problems and easier for government to make good decisions. Before closing, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on some questions related to leadership, diversity, and unity. Not long ago, I faced an unpleasant choice and the need among unattractive alternatives to discern the least bad option. I made the choice I felt was best for the city. I knew it would be difficult, that it would be potentially unpopular, and that it would likely be misunderstood. And because there were, and still are, serious confidentiality issues limiting what could be shared about the matter, I knew that I would have to bite my tongue while opening the door to the potential for confusion and rumor. But it was clear, given the circumstances, what was the right thing to do. The situation illustrates what is perhaps the most important difference between being a candidate for office and being a bearer of executive responsibility. In my role as mayor, I cannot please everyone. Ultimately, this administration and its leadership must be judged on whether the city was well served by our choices and our efforts. We must be judged on whether South Bend becomes on our watch a better place in which to live, work, and raise a family. And my commitment to this city is that I will always make decisions with a view to this goal, whatever the consequences and whatever the appearances. Meanwhile, we have all had occasion to think about what it means to have an inclusive city that reflects the richness and diversity of our community as a whole. Our city made great gains in inclusiveness in recent years, and I'm committed to moving this further forward. I am proud to have assembled a mayor's office staff that includes diversity of ethnicity, race, orientation, gender, and background, not just on my office team, but in appointments to senior positions boards and commissions. We value and seek diversity of age, background, perspective, religion, ethnicity, gender. And when it came to policy, I stood up for diversity at the Common Council a few weeks ago, where it was inspiring to see one citizen after another, young, old, black, gay, white, straight, clergy, student, veteran, all line up to the microphone and call for equal protection under the law. Meanwhile, we're making strides with our Diversity Utilization Board, taking concrete steps to make it easier for women and minority-owned businesses in this community to play a major role in future economic growth and contracting, much as they did in the construction of this Croc Center. And yet, despite all this effort, one thing that has become painfully clear is that many in this community still do not feel that they have an equal place at the table when it comes to enjoying the life of our city or steering the direction of our community. We should face facts. This isn't just people's feelings. It's in the data. Graduation rates, poverty rates, incarceration rates in our community, and personnel measures in our most important institutions, including our governments, show us that we do not yet live 
in a post-racial society. So what more can we do to move in the right direction? What will it take for us as a community to come closer to a reality we all believe in? One in which the opportunity and freedom to be a full participant in our society is in no way constrained by being in any minority. There's no easy answer. But it seems to me that the question of diversity is inseparable from the idea of unity. We need to have a richer concept of what it means to be a united community. And my swearing in, I implored this city to come together because it is the only way we can survive. I'll repeat now what I said then. We know what we are up against, and it is not each other. Our diversity must become our strength, just as diversity has been the strength of our country. That we are a nation of many stripes has challenged us in many ways, but it also makes us who we are. And out of those challenges, we have developed new ideas and a vibrancy that made us the most innovative and creative country in the world. And the same is true for South Bend, an extraordinarily diverse place with an extraordinary tradition of innovation, creativity, and productivity. Our diversity is linked to many challenges, but it is a treasure, and we must remember to see it that way. Unity through diversity comes along a two-way street. We need diverse perspectives in government and in leadership, and we need to ensure that we reach out to all different parts of our community. We do this not just to check boxes, not just to make ourselves feel better about ourselves, but because we have so much to learn from each other, so much to teach each other. It would be naive to think that this community or any community can wipe away the differences between us or to think that by better understanding each other, our disagreements will all melt away. But unity is not about everyone agreeing on every issue or on every decision. No two people will ever agree on absolutely everything. Democracy itself rests upon the wisdom of knowing that total sameness of thought is not possible, nor is it desirable. Unity through diversity is about understanding our differences, learning from them, and remembering what is worth more to us than our individual agendas. It is about understanding where others in our community are coming from and being willing to set aside personal habits or factional priorities in the service of a bigger vision of what we all could become if and only if we all work together to get there. We must recognize that as a community we are in constant negotiation with one another. And in any good negotiation, no one walks out the door completely satisfied, but everyone walks out the door better off. For any of this to work, we need both trust and understanding. We must continue to trust each other, reach out to each other, listen to each other, and ensure that difficult trade-offs are made in good faith with a greater good in mind. We must expect and seek out the best in one another no matter the differences in background, situation, or opinion that come between us. And we must not rush to judgment. Let us ask of ourselves and demand of each other, and especially demand of our leaders, that every action and statement be tested against this standard. Will it help to make our diversity into a source of strength? Or will it serve to divide us one against another? If we persist in seeking unity through diversity, in understanding that civic harmony comes not through the erasure of difference, but through the unification of different interests into an overlapping purpose, then South Bend could be a model city for all. Let me conclude by reiterating that the state of our city is hopeful. People believe in South Bend right now like I've never seen before. And everybody I meet seems to be prepared to do their part. The vision I shared this evening, a new economic direction driven by clear criteria for action and expectations for partnership. Greater support for our independent school system 
by marshalling city resources and using convening power, making public safety a priority, and using evidence-driven accountability to make better decisions, using our internal and external connectedness to survive in a global economy, and holding city government to a higher standard of transparency, efficiency, and cost effectiveness. This isn't just one leader's vision. It's a shared vision that can only be delivered with a shared commitment. This is a building year with much groundwork and heavy lifting still to come. But we are off to a great start, a fresh start, and I believe that 2012 will be remembered as a time of swift progress on the road to our great hometown's comeback. Thank you and good night.